Good morning. Welcome to worship here at American Reformed Church, where we are transformed by Jesus to transform the world through the values of acceptance, grace, wisdom, and love. We are called by God to this place and gather as God's people rising together and singing our praise. us with these words. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other and my praise to no idols. Friends, the peace of this God be with you. Please take a moment to share a sign of that peace with each other this morning. Here in this place, 
we can bring our whole selves. Here, in the presence of our holy, loving God, we can be honest about the truth of our lives. Here, we can confess, knowing that we can say how we feel, and God hears us. We do this through the prayer of confession found in our bulletin. The words are also on the screen. Help, God. I've hit rock bottom. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard. Open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records of wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to you, God, my life a prayer, and wait for what you will say and do. My life's on the line before you, loving God, waiting and watching until the morning, waiting and watching until the morning. We wait and watch for you, God. With your arrival comes love. With your arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it, you will redeem us. You will release us from captivity to sin. Amen. We rise together and sing of our sureness of forgiveness.
Christ, we are forgiven people. Go forth to live in that peace. Amen. At this time, we invite the children forward for a word with Mr. Ben. boys and girls. Do any of you like fishing? <gasps> you do? All right. We are going to tell, we're going to tell a story a little bit about the book of Job using fishing. You ready? Here we go. All right. So I love to fish, and I, in particular, am a fly fisherman. You know What's a fly fisherman? Great question. So, I don't use dead flies. Good question. Yeah. So, if you see this here, this is a fly. A caddis, actually. This is a caddis. All right? So, this is our caddis. And we are going to ca call this caddis fly Job, okay? Now, we are getting towards the end of the story of Job. So Job is here. But we have to back up a little bit. And to do that, we're going to tell you how to, what this fly is made of and some of the things that it went through, okay? Yep. Oh. They, they can like buzzing insects. All right, so that particular fly, like I said, is a caddis. And that caddis is made out of elk hair. Elk hair. The hair of an elk, yeah, pretty. Hmm, that would be a good, qu good question. All right, so I have here some elk hair. I know, it's getting on my pants. It does that. So so this is, yep, it's elk fur, all right? So as, as we're going through the book of Job, if you remember, so Job was, had this amazing life. So if you will, Job at one point was a big, beautiful elk, okay? Now, oh yeah, we'll get to it, hold on. So. As we, he went through the story, he lost everything. So we're going to tell that this way. You ready? For this, I need scissors. Actually, maybe I don't because there's enough shedding right here. So, yes. All right. Actually, I have some more in here too. So. It is from a real elk. Yep. This is called a stacker. You ready? I'm going to see if I can do this with the one hand holding the microphone. All right. Thank you. All right. So here is some of that hair. And you see it's all different lengths. All right? So what I can do is I can take this and I can put it in the stacker like this. Yep, hold on. All right. And then I'm going to tap it. All right, you ready? Now when it comes out, see it's all the same length. It's all aligned. 
And from there, I can pull it out, and I can use it as I'm creating my fly. All right? Kind of. Yep. Yep. Kind of. So, as we're going through this, again, I'm doing my best not to leave all this hair laying around. So we, we take that, and then we use thread. <laughs> we use thread, and I have like a little vise to hold it. So we use thread, and in the end, it ends up like this. So it's tied to a hook, all right? So through that story, so you have this big, beautiful elk, and then we take some of its fur, and we use that fur to create this, okay? Bear with me, we'll get to it. All right, so that fur becoming the, the fly that we can use for fishing teaches us three things that we learned about Job in this story. All right, you ready? So number one, nothing can ever make up for what is lost. See all these little pieces of hair that are laying around? Try as I may, I can't put them back on that elk. I can't make it back home. They have been separated from that piece. All right? Yeah. 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 Nevertheless, even after loss, life can begin again. So it went from this to being this. So it went from being an elk to being a fly. And grief is not the end of the story. And the last thing that I want to share is that loss can transform our perspective. Could you imagine that this could become this? No? Hard to believe. Or how about this one? I have a bunch. I have a bunch. So, kind of interesting, huh? Oh, because I like to fish. And because I have a tendency to get them caught in trees. So, <laughs> seriously. You so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish that would happen. So, I have not found a tree that will give me back my fly yet. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, all right. So, the story of Job tells about someone who is um, extremely powerful and wealthy and then it all gets taken away and then it all gets restored. But it changes. There's loss in there and there's this um, rebuilding and then there's, I mean, there's this continued story. So I told you about a change of perspective. So here's something interesting and I want you to listen to it. Listen for it, okay, when we, when we tell the story. So when Job is rebuilt, when he, his family is rebuilt, they actually get, tell the names of three of his children. Can you listen for those names? You'll have to read because it's really special and unusual, okay? All right, will you pray with me? All right. Lord of creation, you make us new. And though there is grief, that is not the end of the story. We thank you for your unfailing love. Thank you for your commitment to us. And thank you that you transform and use our lives for your glory. In your precious name, amen. All right, thank you. While the kids return to their seats, we prepare our hearts to hear God's word by rising together and singing, Lord, listen to your children praying.
Uh, today we come to the conclusion of the, the series on Job and thinking how we can use pain to transform our lives, to, to make us new. It's not something we get over. We become changed in it. And I think, for me, one of the most powerful truths for Job, of Job that encourages me in my life is that just because you're a follower of Jesus and a believer in God, it doesn't mean everything's going to go your way. I think sometimes we can give that impression, you know, come to Jesus and everything's going to be great. When Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but fear not, I've overcome the world. So I think that's helpful to relieve us from the guilt of, you know, when something happens in our life that's hard and difficult and we think, oh, we're being punished because we're such evil, rotten people. It says Job was a righteous man. <laughs> Job was a righteous man. And these things came into his life. And so I think that's just an overall general encouragement for us as we think about Job and as we conclude that today. And as we, before I read scripture, would you please pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we need you. We need a word from you. For some of us this week, life has been really hard. There's been a lot of difficult things at work. There's been strained relationships here in family or in friendships. And sometimes our own internal feelings and emotions get all twisted and wrapped up and we, we can feel like giving up. Others of us have had a good week, pleasant week. And we feel positive about life. So all of these emotions and feelings come today as we think together of this final chapter in Job's life. Help us to see ourselves in it. Let these not just be words on a page. Let these truths sink into our hearts deeply through your Spirit's presence in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to look at Job 42 today. And we're going to hear together that passage this morning as somewhat the conclusion of the story. Again, skipping a lot of pages, but um, most of those pages of skipping were... Uh, Job and his friends arguing with one another. But here we hear God's word in Job 42. It said, Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, I will question you, and you will declare to me, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has done so Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them and the Lord accepted Job's prayer and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemamiah, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hepak. 
In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. This is the word of the Lord. The point of the story that I have emphasized is that we are to use the pain and the suffering and the loss of our lives and take it into our souls and let it transform our souls, making them enlarge so that we become a more compassionate, kind, and gracious people. Job was that righteous man. And there was a time period he lost everything. Seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, a large number of servants. He was the greatest and wealthiest man in all of the land, and he lost it all. And not only that, he had painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. There was broken, he used broken pottery to scrape his skin. And it's so important to see that it's not those who have done extremely bad things who suffer and that if you do things exactly right, you'll never suffer in this world. And so many people live with guilt and anxiety in this and, and shame when, when they have hard things in their life and, and they feel like, God, what have I done so bad that I have this come? And we would do well to remember Job, who was a righteous man. And all of these things, hard things came into his life. And we saw that three friends came to see him, and they wept, and they sat by him for seven days and seven nights. It was, the, it was wisdom that they did this. It was compassion that they did this. They simply sat there with him. The most compassionate thing that they could have done. No one said a word. No one said a word, so great was his suffering. And then Job cried out to God in lament, and he gave voice to the pain in his soul. Why was I ever born, he cried out. I hurt so bad, I cannot make sense of it. I would just as soon die. There's no peace in my soul. I'm in turmoil, help me, God, help me make some sense of this. I think that there are those of us who have felt that same way. I can't make sense of my life, what's going on. And they waited in humility and trust, and, and there was mystery. There's mystery in our suffering and pain. There's no immediate answer. And maybe we'll never come in this lifetime. You see bits and pieces. You see snapshots of some good that maybe came out of that suffering and pain. And you put those snapshots in an album, but the album is never complete until we see Jesus face to face. Well, the friends were uncomfortable in the silence seven days. I mean, you think about it, it's really amazing that they waited seven days. I mean, we have a hard time waiting five minutes not to say something. They waited seven days and seven nights. It was admirable. But they got uncomfortable. They, they thought, we need to defend God. And here they went into folly, as God pronounced at the end of the chapter. It was folly. It wasn't wisdom. And they tortured Job with his answers. I... <laughs> I never want to torture people with answers. <laughs> I never want to do that. And their answer was, Job, you must have sinned greatly in incredible ways to be punished this badly. And Job said, I, you know, I know I'm a sinner, but really, to this magnitude? No. And they said, well, it must be you. No, I... I know I'm a sinner, but really, not to this degree in depth. It makes no sense. And his friends say, yes, it does. You're just hiding it. You must have sinned 
greatly to have this come in your life. And Job said, you know, I know there's limits. God has set them. All people die. God, you set those days, but my sons and my daughters, why were they taken before me? I'm to die first. I'm to die first in the right order. And life is so fleeting. And he humbled himself and it says that God listened to Job and God listened to his friends. 30 some chapters. Job crying out and his friends with all the answers. And finally God speaks really out of love for Job. And he says, I'm God, you're not. Where were you when I created this world? You are of the earth, you're created. You're created and sustained by me. I'm the center. You're not. God really gave Job no answers to why this was happening, but he did offer Job as a relationship. I'm your God. I'm your God. And God was angry at the friends. The ones that they thought knew it all, Job prayed for them, God forgave them. And it says in the scripture that the Lord blessed the later years of Job's life. Now, I recognize this is not all at once. It's not like saying, boom, one day he got everything. I mean, we all know that it takes a while to get seven sons and three daughters. I mean, that just doesn't happen. That takes time. Years and years. Years and years and years of finding new life in the pain. And the new life was birthed. But here's the thing, it never replaced the old. The pain was always there. But there was a new joy, a new life. Not necessarily better, but new. You know, someone has described it to me once, someone that has gone through a lot of difficult things in their life. When you go through the hard things in your life, it's like you get a scar. And at first, that scar really, really hurts where you've been cut and hurt deeply. And eventually, slowly, it begins to heal. But then you come across those things in life where it gets bumped. And oh, it hurts again. It's a reminder that even though the scar's been healed, it's still there and bumped. It hurts. And the painful memories come back. It could be driving down the road listening and all of a sudden you hear a song. And you're reminded of a person maybe that you lost or you're reminded of a situation that's created a lot of difficulty in your life. And you go, ouch, <laughs> that hurts. It still hurts. Not as sharp as before, but it still hurts. It's still there, the pain. And Job, I think, allowed in the words of the ancients, was a person that had a bright sadness. A bright sadness. I want to be like, I, I, I see people like that. I know people like that who have a bright sadness, who have gone through a lot of difficult things in life, a lot of pain, a lot of misery, a lot of suffering, a lot of loss and difficulty. But there's a bright sadness to them that when you look in their eyes, you see a depth of pain and hurt but around it is a brightness, a light, like it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. 
and they bring a wisdom to your life and my life. And they can look in my eyes when I'm suffering and hurting and say, hey, it's going to be okay. And I see it in their eyes. These are not just words to them. They're not just words. They, I see it in their eyes that, that they've gone through things. And around it, there's a light that has come. And they've experienced that as much as life hurts at times, it's going to be okay. Going to be okay. And Job was blessed. Job is one who has, I believe, that bright sadness. That bright sadness. So, the whole theme of this was meant to encourage us to trust the living God in all the losses of our life, all the pain of our lives, whether it's death or whether it's aging, whether it's jobs, whether it's relationship, in all of those things to trust the living God. To trust. It really is the core and the crux of it all. Will you trust the living God with everything that comes to you in your life? Everything. Will you surrender it to him? The suffering and pain of your life is not something to get over. Don't get over it. Please don't get over it. Absorb it into your soul. And your soul enlarges for God. And you're filled with compassion and love for other people. But it takes trust. And I close with this story from Henry Nouwen. And sometimes when you're going through the hard things of life, it, it's, uh, it feels like you got your feet f- firmly planted in midair. I mean, you feel... Like there's nothing solid beneath you, right? You, you just feel, you feel not only lost, but you feel like I, I got nothing to stand on. I got nothing to give. I got nothing. I'm just, I'm just floating, and I don't know where I'm going to land. I don't know. Henry Nowen tells the story of a trapeze troop. And I share this story in closing this whole book of Job because it's about trust and he writes the story this way he says the flying Rodleys are trapeze artists who performed in the German circus and when the circus came to Freiburg two years ago my friends Franz and Rennie invited me and my father to see the show he writes I will never forget how enraptured I became when I first saw the Rodleys move through the air, flying and catching as elegant dancers. The next day I returned to the circus to see them again and introduced myself to them as one of their great fans. They invited me to attend their practice sessions. They gave me free tickets. They asked me to dinner and suggested I travel with them for a week in the near future. And Henry Nowen writes, I did, and we became good friends. One day I was sitting with Rodley, the leader of the troop, in his caravan, talking about flying. He said, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think that I'm the great star of the trapeze, but the real star of the trapeze is Joe my catcher. He has to be there. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air as I come to him in the long jump. How does it work, I asked. The secret, Rodley said, is that the flyer does nothing. And the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I have simply to stretch out my arms and my hands, and I wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron behind the catch bar. And Henry Nowens, he said, he was surprised. He says, you do nothing? Nothing, Rodley repeated. The worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. 
I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's job to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrists, I might break them. Or he might break mine. And that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly. And a catcher must catch. And the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. And then Nowen writes, When Rodley said this with so much conviction, the words of Jesus flashed through my mind. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Dying is trusting in the catcher. To care for the dying is to say, don't be afraid. Remember that you are the beloved child of God. He'll be there for when you make your long jump. Don't try to grab him. He will grab you. Just stretch out your arms and hands and trust. 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 And I think it's not only in death, but in every circumstance of life. The flyer, us, we're the flyers. In every circumstance of our life, we are the flyers, and we just have to stretch out our arms and hands and trust and trust and trust. And the catcher, God, will catch us. And today you might be in the midst of feeling like your feet are firmly planted in midair, wondering what, what's true in life, what's solid, what's real. And the story is there that we're simply to put out our hands and trust and fly and trust the catcher because he is trustworthy and he's always there for us and all of our pain making all things new making all things new amen amen this time we're going to come before God in a time of prayer and uh, this morning I'm going to use a prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr um it's a prayer that is often used in, in, in AA, the serenity prayer, but as I lead us in prayer this morning, I'm going to use the expanded version of that, the total prayer, not just that little piece that we often hear in the serenity prayer, but the whole thing. So I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you this morning asking that you would grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. Help us to think about that right now. What are some things in our lives right now that we cannot change? There is absolutely nothing that we can do about it. Virtually everything that's happened to us in the past up to this moment, we cannot change. Help us to accept those things we can't change. Give us the courage to change the things we can. Which, if we think about it, is us, our own selves. Because we can't change people. We can't change circumstances. We can't change the past. The only thing that we can change is us our own selves. Give us the courage to change ourselves. And give us the wisdom to know the difference because so much of our life, we spend our lives thinking that we can change other people, we can change this or change that, we control this, we control that, but we don't. We forget our limits. And we forget about looking at our own selves and our own lives. And we forget what Jesus taught us that why do you look at the sawdust in somebody else's eye when you got a log coming out of your own? Give us the wisdom to know the difference. 
living one day at a time. So often, Father, we admit we get caught up living in the past and and we have regrets. Or we look to the future and we have fear. And we forget about this moment right here, right now. Help us to live this moment, this day, enjoying one moment at a time. Not even thinking about what's going to happen this afternoon, but enjoying this moment right here, right now. This is the one we have. And accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Help us to see the hard things of our life as a way to enlarge our soul and we can be transformed by that pain and that hurt. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as we would have it. In other words, helping us to be realistic. Not to be pessimistic or idealistic, but to be realistic. To live a real world, in a real world with real lives. Trusting that you, God, will make all things right if we surrender to your will. And so we do surrender. We are the flyer. You are the catcher. We simply stretch out our arms and fly. We trust you. That we may be reasonably happy in this life. And supremely happy with you forever in the next truly loving God take the pain of every one of our lives today and there's pain here take it and help us to absorb it into our souls that they would expand and grow and we would be filled with compassion and love for all people. And that we would give of our hearts to all people. And to love all people. And to give of ourselves. Not that that takes away the hurt or makes sense of anything, but it gives some good out of hard things. Thank you for these truths. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bottom line is that we're to trust God. We're to trust in him with all of our heart. We're not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him. And he's going to make our path straight, it says in Scripture. It's a promise that we have. And so we come with that kind of trust as we give our gifts today to God in the offering and invite you to stand and sing the doxology as the gifts are brought forward. We respond to God's word by singing together, we are called to be God's people.
couple of announcements. We are nearing the end, not just of the calendrical year, but also the liturgical year as well. In fact, next week is the last week of the liturgical year. So as we prepare for the new liturgical year, there are a bunch of different opportunities that you can take a part of. They are on the back of your bulletin. Two that I want to highlight specifically are Advent Adornment, which will be next week Sunday in the afternoon and early evening. And then also um, a string ensemble that you can sign up for with me if you're interested in participating in a string ensemble during our Advent program, which is December 17. Okay. Thank you. Receive God's blessing. By God's grace, may you trust in the Lord with all of your heart. May you lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, may you acknowledge the living God the catcher. And may we fly, truly fly, trusting the catcher. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.